Hello and welcome to HIV Justice Live, where we highlight what we and others are doing to advocate for HIV justice worldwide in conversation with fellow activists and allies. Today's episode is all about the Oslo Declaration on HIV Criminalization, which celebrates its nine year anniversary this month. You'll learn all about the Oslo Declaration, how and why it was created, what impact it's had, and why it's still relevant today. In short, how a moment became a movement. And helping me to tell the story of the Oslo Declaration on today's show are four people who played a key role in its development. Kim Fangen, who co-organized the meeting and came up with the name. Patrick Aber, then Human Rights Advisor for UNAIDS. Michaela Clayton, former ED of the AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa. And Ralph Jurgens, who attended the meeting as an independent human rights expert. So today we're not only streaming live to Facebook, but for the first time we're also live on YouTube. So why not share the link on your favorite social media platform right now? So did you or your organization sign up to the Oslo Declaration nine years ago? If so, did you use it in your advocacy? Let us know. Or do you have any questions for our guests? We want to hear from you. You can write your comments or your questions underneath either of the live streams, or you can use the hashtag HIV Justice on Twitter. So the Oslo Declaration on HIV Criminalization provided a 10-point roadmap that we hoped would lead to significant law reform. It was created nine years ago by 20 committed HIV and human rights advocates from all over the world at a side meeting to a UNAIDS high-level policy consultation. Nine days after it was finalized, the Oslo Declaration was published on the brand new HIV Justice Network website. And within weeks, it had been crowdsourced translated into seven other languages by its early supporters. We made it possible for anyone to sign on to the show, uh, for anyone to sign on to show their support. And within a few months, the number of supporters had grown from the original 20 to over 1,750 individuals and organizations from more than 115 countries in pretty much every corner of the world. This was the beginning of a global network of advocates working for HIV justice. And looking back, it's clear now that the Oslo Declaration was the founding document of the HIV justice network. You know, it's not too late to become a supporter. When you sign up, you show your solidarity with the HIV justice worldwide movement, and that's something we need now more than ever. So let's remind ourselves of who was in the room where it happened with one of the first videos we ever produced. here in Oslo and supporting the Oslo Declaration because we need a global movement uh, on this issue. I support the Oslo Declaration because criminalization of HIV transmission is a worldwide problem. More and more countries are even joining in uh, adopting their own HIV laws. I support the Oslo Declaration because it sets out very clearly, very succinctly, in a way that should be understood by all people, the reasons why the criminalization of transmission, exposure and non-disclosure are unjustifiable in almost all except the most egregious cases. I and the AIDS Funds also uh, support the Oslo Declaration because I think it's about time after 30 years into this epidemic to really stop this criminalization, which is about stigma, it's not about facts. I support the uh, Oslo Declaration because it states that lawmakers should take into consideration uh, advances in science uh, on HIV. I support the declaration because we need to end this injustice. This is stigmatizing, um, it's, it's just bad law and it's bad public health. ERASA supports the Oslo Declaration because it presents an alternative to using the criminal law in situations where the criminal law really has no effect at all. We should be looking at what works scientifically and medically um, in terms of addressing the epidemic. I support the Oslo Declaration simply because it is addressing the issue that's not really being talked about so much. It gives people who have been prosecuted a voice. 
I support the Oslo Declaration because we have to get the rest of the world to understand why this is a problem. My organization supports the Oslo Declaration because we need all the support we can get from our friends from all over the world to try to get the Swedish government to understand that it has to follow the UNAIDS recommendations. I support the Declaration uh, of Oslo because it encourages us to uh, keep up the fight. I support the Oslo Declaration because I think it's um, the first uh, declaration that's bringing the issue closer. I really wish that people are taking some time to read it through and, and think about the issues. We support the Oslo Declaration because we think this is an, an important contribution uh, to our continuous lobbying in Norway. And we hope that this declaration finally will end the criminalization ghost that so many people are affected by. What I hope that we can get out of this Oslo declaration is that it will be um, a beginning of uniting um, a voice and, uh, and, and the minds of people who are involved in this. It will be a tool that activists all over the world can, can use. I support the Oslo declaration because I think it's a handy tool for people who don't know much about criminalization to understand in a very easy read why it's important not to have laws and policies on our books that criminalize HIV transmission. I believe that any effort to speak out against HIV criminalization and to support the efforts of advocates around the world in ending that kind of discrimination uh, merits our support. I think it should be supported because it is the product of the work of people who have thought about this for more than a decade who are informed about the issues both theoretically, politically, personally, and because it represents the position of a committed, intelligent and sensitive community of people who have simply had enough and need to be heard. You said it, Matthew. Thank you to that incredible group of people, some of whom are still working with the HIV Justice Network and some of whom you're about to meet. And by the way, you can watch and share this video on the HJN YouTube channel. So now I'd like to introduce our first guest, Kim Fangen, who joins us from somewhere south of Oslo in Norway. Welcome, Kim. It's so great to see you again. Thank you very much and great to see you too. This video. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we've come a long way. Kim, so we first met a few years before that meeting. And at the time, I was a, a community based journalist and activist, and I was blogging about HIV criminalization. And I couldn't believe how harsh the law was in Norway, as well as in its Nordic neighbors in, in Sweden and Finland. And Kim, you were you know, an activist, you'd been working, uh, doing global policy work on entry stay and residence restrictions, and now you were working against HIV criminalization in Norway. But do you remember why we decided to create the Oslo Declaration, Kim? Um, no, I've actually, I, I don't. But I think you know, it came out of all, all the work we were trying to do. And uh, also my experience working with travel restrictions was that um, because Norway was championing the, that with, with, uh, with UNAIDS and, uh, and getting all these uh, different countries together and all these different people and minds together, we, we managed in quite a short time to, to do a lot of change. I think it took about three years since we started um, until the uh, United States declared that uh, that they they lifted the ban completely, so so that was you know an uh, an inspiration to try to do some something different uh, something similar with with the uh, criminalization, um, but also uh, the, the situation in Norway was was quite opposite because uh, Norway was uh, a good nation when it came to travel restrictions and not so good when it came to criminalization. So it was a diff different battle altogether. Yeah, I mean, and you were the only person openly living with HIV on the Norwegian Law Commission that has been set up to, to take a look at reviewing the law in Norway. And <clears throat> I remember we had a conversation, you weren't so happy about the way things were going. And we, we talked uh, a little bit about the, 
the title of, of what we were going to uh, put together, and you persuaded me that it should actually be called the Oslo Declaration. Uh, do you remember that conversation? It, it was, uh, it was, it's, for you, it was very important, I think, to actually situate it in Oslo uh, to, to make the change, wasn't it? Yes, and I think it's, uh, you know, I think Norway and has always taken pride in, in leading and being kind of a, um, you know, a, 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 to find solutions and, uh, and uh, between, for instance, between Israel and Palestine, you know, they were, they were involved in that. And so they, it was it's quite, quite, you know, it was quite good ring to it. And of course, you know, one of my uh, main goals was trying to, to change the the, um, how how this was looked upon and and, and the government they, they were so you know they were so uh, rigid and it was uh, and I was uh, when I, I was very happy to be part of the commission but but uh, I knew almost straight away that this was going to be you know very very difficult to get a majority and um, and um, so it started to go in in the wrong direction very early. And I know that they invested a lot in me because they thought that you know if if I could, if they could turn me around you know that they 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 felt that it it would uh, it would um, it would change the opinion, um, and so so I and we were pretty desperate. So that was why we thought this was a good idea, and 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 especially to get you know international attention and uh, towards this and i of course i got a lot of help from from uh, my my fellow nordic friends in in denmark and sweden and also in in finland and um so we tried and and you know there, there were a lot of talks and there were a lot of scandinavian meetings and um so I think all of this, uh, all of these efforts, left left uh, led us into to the Oslo Declaration, and also the meeting we had in February. Uh, you know, the 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 law commission was still going on. We didn't we mm. didn't hand over this this uh, this um, document until uh, um, uh, October to to the health minister. So you know, there was a slight hope <laughs> that we that we might be able to turn things around. That's right, because we so we basically pulled together on a shoestring this sort of meeting on the sidelines of the uh, of the UNAIDS high level policy consultation that was mm. uh, funded by the government of Norway, um, mm. and we did it on a shoestring. I, you somehow managed to find some money, and uh, and with that you you secured the most sumptuous meeting room. I remember it was it was it felt so luxurious, um, yeah. but. <laughs> what 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 do you remember about the meeting itself? Well, I thought it was you know it was amazing that as you said we managed in in such a short time to get all this together and all these wonderful and and um, marvelous experienced people to get get them all together in in this room and um, so so and I was really hopeful. Because, as I said, you know, at that point that there was still still a chance, and and also there were were some, uh, we we got a lot of attention, you know. So so, uh, and um, and Norway is very vary about criticism from abroad. So I thought that this was, <laughs> this was going to help us. So um, and I thought um, I you know the, the the what we managed to create and and you know the 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 amount of people who have signed on to this is is really impressive yeah so let's talk about the impact that the Oslo declaration actually had in norway you said the law commission report came out later that year mm. um i think we were all very very disappointed um and then i i remember we uh, i did we wrote an a, an interview with you uh, on, on the blog, or it was, I think it was one of the first things on the HGM website, saying that you stood alone, um, uh, advocating to have no uh, specific criminal law mm. in Norway. And then it, it took, I think, until 2017 for law reform to actually happen. Um, but were you happy with what happened in 2017? Not really. I thought this was, uh, you know, we were almost there but but not quite and and it it's uh, again it's you know it's uh, uh, it is those 
most at risk, those most vulnerable, which still, you know, you you can you can you can prosecute. And you know, I I just can't understand all the, all the arguments we had, and and uh, uh, they, they didn't manage to to take that that into consideration. And it's uh, no, so 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 that was very disappointing. But of course, the situation in Norway now is that most people are on medication, so we we hardly have had any, have have had any cases since since that time. But you know, still there is a it is it's used as a threat and um, the point of that is so so destructive so yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it's it, so we we haven't we haven't seen any uh, any cases since 2017 that have been reported but uh, as you say the the law is still there particularly for people who don't have an undetectable viral load um, and you know that's that's one of the things that we're we're fighting for is to is to get rid of all laws regardless of of people's uh, uh, mm. access to treatment. Mm. So in, in in the video we showed earlier, you said, "I hope it'll be a tool that activists all over the world can use." And mm. well, it's, it's since the it's the ninth anniversary, I asked our research coordinator Sylvie Beaumont to do some research to find out some of the ways that the declaration has been used. So, you know, it's been part of global guidance. Uh, UNAIDS, Amnesty International, and then US uh, AID and PEPFAR recognize it as uh, a part of global guidance. It's been used for advocacy uh, in the Caribbean um, and in Jamaica specifically. It's, uh, it's remarkable. Helped with strategic planning. Uh, some high profile media, there's the New York Times and uh, the Huffington Post. It was used uh, for, as evidence for law reform in Canada. Uh, it's mentioned in many peer-reviewed articles and helped to support legal change in Zimbabwe. That's quite something, isn't it, Kim? That's really impressive. <laughs> you must be yeah, proud. We, yeah, I mean, we, we had no idea, I think, that, uh, that it was going to have that kind of impact. So... Um, now, uh, for people watching, do you use it in your advocacy? Do you have any kind, uh, any questions uh, or comments for me or for Kim? Then post them under the live stream on Facebook or YouTube or use the hashtag HIV Justice on Twitter. So for now, thank you so much, Kim, but we'll see you later in the show for the question and answer session. Thank you, too. So our next guest wasn't directly involved in the Oslo Declaration, but he and his brilliant former UNAIDS colleague, Susan Timberlake, played a crucial role in its development and dissemination. So welcome Patrick Aber, who joins us from Bangui in the Central African Republic. It's so good to see you again. It's Are a you there, pleasure Patrick? to be on the show, Edwin. Thank you very much for reaching out. Yes, I'm oh, here. It's, and it's really a pleasure <laughs> to be on the show. Edwin. That's great, Patrick. Thank you. Th thanks for being here. So our civil society meeting took place in Oslo because it was where that, that high-level policy consultation was taking place. And that meeting brought together representatives of governments and the criminal justice system, but it also brought some of those most brilliant uh, civil society human rights experts into one place. What can you tell us about the background to the meeting and, and why Oslo? Well, Edwin, you will know that um, uh, UNAIDS, since its inception, has always been um, very mindful of the impact of the law on the response to HIV. And Kim, uh, just before I spoke, reminded us that um, UNAIDS has been working for many years on the issue of um, travel restriction and its impact on the HIV response. And another legal issue that has concerned UNAIDS is that of the unjust application of the criminal law against people in HIV. And while we've been working on this issue for many years, in 2010, uh, UNAIDS decided to look at the issue with a very different lens, recognizing that uh, change on this issue will only happen 
if we were able to marshal both the scientific evidence together with the legal evidence to justify why the use of the criminal law against people living with HIV is not only wrong, but it is also harmful to the response to HIV. And as a result, in 2010, with uh, funding and the support of the government of Norway, UNAID started this evidence building and policy dialogue project to bring together the evidence on HIV and the criminal law, uh, marshalling the law and the science. And so we started with um, conducting research on the subject, legal and scientific research. And then in August and September 2011, UNAIDS called for the first time on the global stage, uh, a meeting of legal experts and scientists, leaders in the science of uh, HIV. And those experts came together, they analyzed uh, the issues involved, and they helped us better understand some of the fundamental issues uh, as it, when it comes to uh, the law and the science of HIV. Then with this, scientist, uh, with this scientific evidence, with the knowledge that the legal expert gave us, UNAIDS felt that it was critical to then bring it to policy uh, leaders, to uh, government officials, um, to ministers, and to others, such as members of parliament, for them to really consider the scientific evidence, and on the basis of that, to support change. And that was the reason why we were in Oslo. And Oslo was about bringing together policy uh, and leaders from government, together with legal experts, with scientists, and civil society, to consider the evidence and help us take forward the change that we wanted to see in the world in ensuring that um, uh, the use of the criminal law was not going to harm the response to HIV. And looking and back now... Norway, we in Oslo. First, because the government of Norway... Yes, we were in Oslo first because the government of Norway supported this project. And we felt that it was important uh, as they graciously uh, offered that we join this meeting and we organize it in Norway. We felt that it was not just uh, um, important to be there in Norway to hold it, but as Kim also mentioned, uh, Norway uh, has a symbolism to itself. Uh, of course, uh, Norway and Oslo is the place of the Nobel Prize, but also it is a country that in itself was also struggling with the issues involved in HIV criminalization. And also let's remember that at the time, Nordic countries were among the countries with the highest per capita number of prosecution for HIV criminalization. So there were a number of reasons that made Norway uh, and particularly Oslo the most suited place for having uh, this particular um, policy dialogue on the science and the law of HIV criminalization. And Patrick, looking back now, it's clear that this time in Oslo was an extremely <laughs> important <laughs> moment for the global movement to end overly broad HIV criminalization. What do you think, you know, why, why, what happened in Oslo that led to this movement? Well, I think th there are maybe three things that happened in Oslo that I believe led to that movement. I think the first thing that happened in Oslo that was so significant, again, at the global stage, some elements of it were, were happening at country level. Uh, but on the global stage, this was really the first time it happened, which is that we saw scientists, these are experts in the, in the science of HIV, together with legal experts, with government officials, with civil society coming together to really consider and the issues and find a way forward. 
This was the first time this was happening on the global stage, and that was significant. The second thing that we saw in Norway that was also very meaningful was that civil society groups came together. Um, maybe they had come together on this issue before, but we saw the beginning of a global coalition. Activists from the global north, from the global south, uh, coming together on this issue of HIV criminalization and recognizing that it was a peculiar time. And I think the fact that you didn't just meet in the sideline of the meeting to discuss the issue, but felt that you needed a document of your own that we catalyze your advocacy, that is the Oslo Declaration, I think made that moment very, very special. And of course, also the fact that um, we were in Oslo on the heels of HTPN 052, that very game-changing um, um, uh, research that was announcing the transformation of HIV treatment as prevention. And, and that itself also, I think, brought new air to the movement that could really signal that something different was happening, including in the science and how we understood the drastic impact of HIV treatment in reducing the likelihood of HIV transmission. And, and that was significant. And I think all those together really made uh, Oslo a particular moment. Thanks, Patrick, for that really brilliant insight, actually. Uh, unfortunately, there's no more, no more time for any more questions for you at the moment. But if uh, anyone watching has questions or comments for Patrick, then post them under the live stream on Facebook or YouTube, or use the hashtag HIV Justice on Twitter. For now, thank you so much, Patrick. But we'll see you a bit later for the Q&A. Thank you, Edwin. So we've already seen some examples of the global impact of the Oslo Declaration, and we were also delighted to support and document the formation of the Mexican Network Against HIV Criminalization back in 2017. And it was wonderful to see how the Oslo Declaration was the template used for the creation of the Mexican Declaration. Let's see what happened. Never underestimate what's possible when a group of committed HIV activists and dedicated leaders come together at a well-organized, funded meeting, providing training and tools to change bad HIV laws. The result? A powerful declaration and a new national network. And soon after, a lawmaker's U-turn and a firm commitment for HIV law reform. In October 2017, the first Spanish-language HIV is not a crime meeting took place in Mexico City. Yo creo que esta esta reunión es inédita en México porque por primera vez eh, organizaciones de la sociedad civil nos sentamos a pensar, a discutir y a conocer el impacto de la criminalización en nuestro país. Participants learned about HIV criminalization around the world, the global movement to end HIV criminalization, and the importance of the leadership of people living with HIV networks. Prior to me coming here, I didn't really understand uh, criminalization and how it really implicates on the lives of persons living with HIV. And I think that's an issue that we need to work worldwide and uh, in especially in our region of Latin America and the Caribbean. After analyzing the legal situation across Mexico, strategizing to come up with solutions and passionate discussions, by the meeting's end, participants rolled up their sleeves and created the 11-point Mexican Declaration Against HIV Criminalization. Bueno, yo lo mínimo que esperaría que saliera de este foro es que pudiésemos crear una red mexicana en contra de la criminalización, eh, que trabajáramos de manera coordinada en todo el país. And they wasted no time getting their message out.
Incredibly, two weeks later, at a meeting with key Quintana Roo lawmakers, network representatives presented the declaration to Congresswoman Laura Badestein, who last year pushed for a new unjust, overly broad HIV criminal law. The result? A firm commitment to repeal Quintana Roo's problematic HIV law. Congratulations to the new Mexican network, an inspiration to everyone fighting HIV-related injustice. And the Mexican network goes from strength to strength. And if you want to see this or any other videos featured in the show, you can visit our YouTube channel. Our next guest is a human rights lawyer who has worked on HIV and human rights issues in Namibia, across the region, and internationally since 1989. She was the founding director of the AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa and sits on an impressive number of UN and Global Fund advisory groups. Please welcome Michaela Clayton, who joins us from Windhoek in Namibia. Thank you. Hi, Michaela. Thanks for having me. And I'm also delighted to announce that Michaela's just joined the uh, supervisory board of the HIV Justice Network. Thank you for doing that too. <laughs> My pleasure. So, Michaela, I think we first met at the 2008 International AIDS Conference in Mexico City. And to be honest, I was completely in awe of you. You were part of that first wave of HIV and human rights activists who sounded the early alarm on HIV criminalization and helped create the first global guidance and advocacy tools that came out around 2008 and then 2009. But what do you think was different about the Oslo Declaration? I, I think, as, as um, Patrick mentioned before, I think the difference with the Oslo Declaration was it really was the first time that there was a, a coming together of, of, of um, activists from the global north and the global south um, to, to, to put together a declaration at, a, <clears throat> at, a, at an international level. Um, you know, before that, a, a lot of work had been, doing, been, had been done in different countries and different regions, but it was really the first time that there was a, a global showing of solidarity around this issue. And uh, I mean, it was also in for the founding document in, in retrospect of the HIV Justice Network. And, um, you know, we struggled for a while with funding. But I remember a lunch we had together in Hove with Christine Stegling from the International Aid, HIV AIDS Alliance, that's now Frontline AIDS. Well, we, that was, about, I think, 2014. And we did some brainstorming. And then soon after, we had an, an opportunity to apply for Robert Carr Fund Grant with ARASA as lead. Do you remember how, how we got from that, that lunch to, to getting the funding at the end of 2015? Because, I mean, it felt like, for, for me, winning the lottery. <laughs> it was, um, I mean, I think that the opportunity presented itself in the sense that, you know, there was a call for applications from the, from the Robert Carr Fund, and, and um, criminalisation seemed to be an issue that, that really did need support in terms of... Um, you know, allowing us to to actually do some work on the ground because a lot of the work that had been done by you um, and other people previously had been very little funding, um, and a lot was achieved through that. I mean, the blog that you started in um, when was it, uh, two thousand and seven, on HIV yeah. criminalization. I mean, really became a global resource, filling a, a much needed gap by capturing what was happening, you know, in real time on the ground in terms of, of, of prosecutions. Um, but there really seemed to be a need to uh, sort of formalise a, a, a network of different organisations coming together to work on this and to try and get some money to do that work. And it was th it was that for that reason and that was how we came together to put together the coalition, which, as I recall, was... Canadian AIDS Legal Network, or another Canadian, uh, yeah, Canadian AIDS Legal Network, uh, GMP, Pl uh, GMP Plus, um, and Zero, um, Zero Project, and the Positive Women's Network of the USA. Um, 
what was interesting about that coalition <laughs> was that it was led by an organization from the south as opposed to an organization from the north. And I'm, I'm very proud, I think, to say that um, I think it was a good case, a good example of uh, south-north capacity building. <laughs> <laughs> That's so it's true, Nicola. I, no, I I really learned so much from you. I think when I think how naive I was as an activist to then uh, to to move in to, to to do this work, and I learned so much from you and of course your brilliant team at Arasa. Um, I'm, I'm forever grateful. Um, but I, let's talk about the the difference that uh, HIV Justice Worldwide has made, particularly across Southern and Eastern Africa, where where you work, and especially. Uh, for women? Well, I mean, it's interesting because, the, you know, I was just thinking back historically when this discussion first started, really, in, in Southern Africa around criminalization. And, and it was in 2007 um, where there was an increasing call by uh, primarily women's organizations for, for you know, the, the sort of enactment of criminal laws to deal with HIV uh, transmission. And one, in a sense, can understand the, um, you know, the rationale behind it. But women were feeling extremely frustrated by the fact that they um, didn't have the power within their own relationships to insist on safer sex or to, um, you know, to to um, leave a relationship if they were not able to insist on safer sex because they were often economically dependent on their their partners or husbands. Um, and so women felt that criminal law was the way to go in terms of preventing themselves from becoming infected. And it was in 2007 that um, ARASA and the um, OSISA, the Open Societies, um, what was then the, the Institute for Southern Africa, um, co-hosted a meeting in Johannesburg um, and invited primarily women's organizations, but also HIV organizations. And it was one of those, it, in my career, it's one of the meetings I'll never forget, which was which was like, the, it was a meeting where there were these like these light bulb moments going off all over the place where when we started interrogating what was the impact of HIV criminalization on women who were calling for criminalization, it became very apparent very quickly that, um, you know, that, that criminalization was really not the answer. Women are the first to know their status very often because of um, antenatal care. They're not often in a position to disclose that to their partners because of a really, you know, real fear of violence or being thrown out of the home, not able to insist on safer sex. And then when the partner tests HIV positive, which was generally after the fact of the woman testing positive, she would be blamed for bringing HIV into the household um, and ultimately being prosecuted. So it, it, it was a real sort of game changer, I think, in terms of, um, you know, getting, getting women particularly to rethink about um, where the criminalization really was effective. And it kind of moved on from there. Um, you know, as uh, 2000 and, what was it, 2009, eight, I think it was, the, the 10 reasons to, 2008, the 10 reasons to oppose criminalization um, uh, of HIV exposure or transmission was developed by a coalition of HIV and human rights and women's organizations and was published by the Open Societies Institute. Um, mm -hmm. Then subsequently, the, the previous slide that you showed was the 10 reasons why criminal law harms women, um, mm -hmm. which was also you know, published as a result of a similar coalition. And it really helped with, um, you know, it really helped with advocacy in the region um, to try and get parliamentarians to understand why these laws are not effective. Um, yeah, and, and having HIV justice worldwide just means that you know, you have a, it, it, it's it, it's good for decision makers and poli policy makers to see that it's not just something that's being made a noise about in a particular country or in a particular region, but that it's something that is, you know, that is being addressed worldwide by a very broad spectrum of um, organizations and actors who've come together in this HIV justice worldwide. So for me, that really is one of the, is one of the benefits of it, yeah. Well, absolutely. And, you know, Arasa also did some amazing work with SADC parliamentarians, um, uh, uh, helped uh, prevent a law being passed in Malawi, helped with uh, advocacy in Zimbabwe. I mean, that, so the, 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 I mean, the work actually 
the, the, though that policy work actually has come to fruition, obviously there's still a lot more to do, but uh, mm -hmm. you know it, it really it really did it really has made a difference, and uh, I so appreciate it. Now, Makala, I know you stepped down as Arasa's director at the end of 2019, and I'm. I'm so excited to have you on our supervisory board, but you know that's an unpaid position. So you're now a health and human rights consultant, I believe. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, moved yeah. Moved out into the world of consulting. <laughs> well, so if you've got any questions or comments or consultancy work for Michaela, then post them <laughs> under the live stream on Facebook or YouTube, or use the hashtag <laughs> HIV Justice on Twitter. Every little helps. Thanks so much, Michaela. We'll see you later for the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Edwin. So until she joined our supervisory board, Michaela was a member of our Global Advisory Panel, or GAP, our international expert group of individuals working on HIV and human rights. And in each episode of HIV Justice Live, we highlight a GAP member. And this segment is lovingly hosted by HJN's Partnerships and Governance Coordinator, Julian Howes, who many years ago used to work for London Transport, and that's why we call this segment Mind the Gap. Welcome to Mind the Gap. And what's your name? Eli Balan. And what are your pronouns, Eli? My pronouns are he and his. And uh, where in the world are you? I'm based in Beirut, Lebanon. And what do you do there? I'm the director of M Coalition, uh, LGBTIQ and Key Population Health Network. And what are your activities around HIV criminalization? Well, it's mostly around documentation, referral, and access to legal services and aid. And why have you decided to become a member of the HIV Justice Network Global Advisory Panel? As a person living with HIV, I've mitigated around HIV criminalization uh, my entire life. So I think it's very important to support people in having access to um, information that will make them live healthier, safer lives. Ellie, we asked you to bring along a photo that meant something to you. Tell us about this. So this is actually the opening ceremony of the International AIDS Conference in 2016 in Durban. That was my first AIDS conference and it was after this uh, this speech and actually after hearing so many inspiring speeches that I went to my hotel room, I opened up my laptop and I came out about my HIV for all my Facebook friends because for me that was the only way to make a difference uh, in my region is them to have to know about me so that they can trust me in this. So this photo means really a lot to me because that was the moment that allowed me to open up about my HIV to the world. Wow, that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Any regrets? Not at all. I'm very happy about it. It has made my life much, much easier. That, that's so wonderful. Thank you, Ellie. Now for some final questions. When was the last time you were really proud of yourself? Well, a couple of months ago, I presented at a pharmaceutical company to their staff who have not spoken or talked to someone living with HIV. And that was really inspiring and made me feel very proud. Wow. And how are you keeping sane in the COVID pandemic? Well, there's a lot of cooking. Uh, I play with my plants and I have my two adorable pet cats. Wow. And finally, tell us something about yourself that nobody in the HIV sector probably knows. Well, in 2006, that was some, some time ago, I was actually elected Mr. Gay Lebanon. Um, it was, didn't require a lot to do, but, you know, it's official. Ah, thank you, Ellie Balan, um, Director of Health and Relief at M Coalition and all-round superstar. Thank you, Ellie and Julian. And uh, you can find this video to watch and share on your YouTube channel. So my final guest joined the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria as Senior Coordinator of Human Rights in May 2015. Before that, he worked at the Open Society's Public Health Programme. And before that, he co-founded the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, now the HIV Legal Network, which continues to be a key partner in our HIV Justice Worldwide Coalition. So welcome, Ralph Jurgens, who joins us from Geneva. Edwin, hi. It's a great pleasure to be with you. It's so great to have you here too, Ralph. So Ralph, you attended the Oslo meeting as an independent expert and you were part of that first wave of advocates that I talked about with Michaela. And I remember you said something to me at the Oslo meeting that stuck with me. 
that you were passing on the baton. Do you remember that? I, what, what, what did you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Well, at the time, I had already worked on the issue for nearly 20 years. And uh, it was really time, and it was great to see that there were so many passionate people who took on the issue. And I didn't feel that I needed to contribute to that particular issue so much anymore. Um, and remember, again, uh, the first involvement of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network on criminal laws was a report that we did as early as 1996 on the issue and that Richard Elliott uh, wrote. And of course, he has become one of the greatest advocates against criminalization uh, that we know. Yeah, I mean, I, I love Richard and we, uh, we work very closely together today. And yeah, so you had a, a sense of relief that there was a new wave of of uh, of, uh, of, ad, of activists in town, and it it basically freed you up to to move on to to other things. And uh, in the video, you said that HIV criminalization was bad law and bad public health, and to, there are a lot of bad laws that are bad for public health. And so now you're at the Global Fund. What are you trying to do about those? <clears throat> Well, at the Global Fund, we have a major initiative called Breaking Down Barriers, and it's all about removing human rights related barriers to health services, HIV, TB and malaria, and now also COVID. And of course, bad laws and policies are one of the most formidable barriers. And at the Global Fund, we recognize that we need to reduce those barriers because we simply cannot have the impact that we otherwise would have if people are criminalized, if they fear accessing health services, if they fear violence and are subjected to violence by police. Uh, and uh, yeah, if the stigma and discrimination continues. And so we have invested a lot more resources uh, into fighting laws and uh, policies and discrimination uh, overall, and also to ensure access to justice. So could you give us uh, an example uh, of the programs at country level that the Global Fund is, is supporting to break down barriers? Well, we're supporting mainly the seven key programs to reduce stigma and discrimination and increase access to justice that UNAIDS first defined and uh, that we know um, from evidence make a difference if we implement them at scale in countries. And that had never been done before. And with the resources of the Global Fund, that's what we're trying to achieve now. And there's still a lot of work to be done. You're working in 20 countries uh, and hoping to expand. Um, how, how can the HIV Justice Worldwide movement help to break down more of those barriers? Well, we fund many projects at country level um, in countries by advocates in countries to fight bad laws and policies. But what you're doing is provide global leadership on the issue, and that's also incredibly important. The groups that we work with benefit from the work that you do, from your materials, from uh, this video, which I hope many of our grantees will be able to watch. Well, that, that, that's great to hear. There's, I mean, there is so much more to be done and I so appreciate you joining us today. So, but please stay, stay with us, Ralph, for the Q&A because I'd like will. to invite um, by all the guests as well as introduce uh, HGN's new communications coordinator, Dennis Anzu. Oh, sorry, Ralph. Carry on, Ralph. I just wanted to bring someone else well, who was in Othello with us into the show, uh, Susan Timberlake. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my you, goodness, Susan you Timberlake. You talked about her earlier, and, uh, well, she's here with me, so I thought that she should come in briefly and say a few words herself. Oh, what an amazing surprise. I had no idea you were going to be here, Susan. It is so wonderful to see you. Well, thank you very much, Edwin. I don't want to break in, but I was passing through Ralph's uh, living room and I <laughs> saw this wonderful show and I just wanted to say hello and pop my historical head into the meeting <laughs> and, and, and say I just will never forget what an incredible uh, 
support you were through all the work that UNAIDS did on this issue. You goaded us, you told us, you and, and all of the wonderful activists on this show that we had to do more, 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 and we tried. And um, that Oslo meeting nine years ago, it's quite a memory still. I, I, I just wanted to tell your viewers that it overlapped uh, on Valentine's Day and we hung a sign that said, make love, not criminal laws. And um, we tried to convince all those people there of um, the actual justice involved here, the need to grapple with these complex issues on a evidence-based and scientific-based way and to overcome the prejudice and discrimination and ignorance that was out there driving those, the bad laws and the bad application of those laws. So I just wanna congratulate you and Nick and all the activists on this call and the many people who've taken the declaration and with just incredible work and precision made made it into a real movement, as you said, a real movement for change. You should be very proud. Oh, thank you, Susan. I think I'm going to, I think we're going to cry. Uh, I, I, so, <laughs> well, I, 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 do you want to say, you can, you're welcome to please stay, stay for the Q&A. Uh, it would be lovely if, if you can. Okay, I'll, I'll stay next with pleasure. Up. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, Edwin, she she's been pro she goaded you at the time, and she still does that with me today. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Well, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it was it was there was some mutual goading, but no, I remember you mentored me. So I mean, Susan, you meant you basically helped me figure out how to speak in public. And now look, I'm hosting a live web show. <laughs> and you and Nick are doing a beautiful job. It's fantastic quality. Thank you, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so now back to uh, to the show. I'd like to invite back all of our guests uh, and introduce uh, HGN's new communications coordinator, Dennis Nziaka, who joins us from Nairobi in Kenya. Hi, Dennis. Welcome to the team and to the show. So, what's been going on on Facebook or YouTube or, or Twitter? I feel like I was in a family reunion, and I think. <laughs> <laughs> the comments, the likes, and you know, everybody sending in emojis of hearts and, and power. It really felt that this was a community, it was a family that was coming back together, celebrate a milestone. Uh, the people are saying it was passionate, uh, guys, because people you really gel together well. Um, and I think it goes from your expression, from the relationship that you guys have. There's one particular comment that really struck, and it was something that Michaela said, south to north capacity building. Um, and I think people have really reacted to that. Probably Michaela can say something to it because we are usually used to north to south, not south to north. So probably Michaela can say something about that. <laughs> okay. Well, I was being a little bit facetious, but, um, but actually not really. Uh, because um, I mean, Edwin, Edwin was a complete the content, but in terms of uh, running an organisation, mm, there was some work to be done. So, <laughs> so um, we we helped him with setting up systems and policy stuff like that, and um, granting and all that kind of thing. So yeah, it was a, I, for us, it was a really good experience of like sharing, our, oh, sorry, now my dogs are starting to, um, sharing an experience that we you know, put together over the years that we could share with helping a new organization start up. Sorry, my dogs, apologies. <laughs> all right, Michaela. Thank you very much, Michaela. And I think from the comments, uh, the generally it is, this is a family, people are getting back together. Uh, there's a lot of new people joining in, uh, new voices, new subscribers. And I feel that because this was the first show, people really wanted to get in, stuff out, get a feel of things. And from the look of things, I think it's a wonderful start for 2021. It's a good historical lesson for most of us who probably were not there. Uh, there has been much that has been done with uh, the Oslo Declaration, but also the movement building part has to be acknowledged as well. 
and the team that was there to build to, to, to it up to today. And I think with that, I think I'll throw it back to Edwin to close the show. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much, Dennis. I, I'm still feeling quite verklempt uh, uh, with the surprise uh, appearance from Susan. Uh, but I, I mean, it's been fantastic to see all of you again. And it, it's wonderful to, to get to, to, to be able to share, I guess, this, this family reunion. Obviously, we're all, all over the world. We haven't been able to see each other for a long time anyway because of COVID. And uh, I'm so glad that we've been able to reunite, be uh, reunited on this show. So if you want to see this show again or share it with friends and colleagues, it's available on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. But now I'd like to thank all of our guests today, Kim Fangen, Patrick Aber, Michaela Clayton, Ralph Jurgens, Susan Timberlake, and Ali Balan. And thanks also to our director, Nicholas Feustel, Julian Howes, Dennis and Zioka, and the rest of the HGN team. And of course, to all of you for watching and participating. See you soon for the next HIV Justice Live.